first time you can buy marijuana legally in parts of Colorado, purely for recreational use. Pot, anything less than an ounce, no longer illegal in Washington state. Alaska is now the third state to legalize recreational marijuana. Marijuana is now legal in the nation's capital. Voters in Oregon, Alaska, and Washington, D.C. approved legislation allowing recreational use of the drug. The United States of America is quickly turning green. Cannabis legalization is one of the only issues to have bipartisan support with politicians and the public alike. While there are still many battles to fight and minds to change, cannabis legalization seems inevitable in the U.S. and will undoubtedly lead to drug reform throughout the world. In 2012, Colorado and Washington State legalized recreational cannabis. However, sales didn't begin in Washington until July 2014. 20 months after Washington voters approved recreational marijuana, the wait is over. At Cannabis City in Seattle, a 65-year-old grandmother defied stereotypes. Deb Green was first in line. It's very liberating. You look, you, I never thought I'd see this in my lifetime, ever. Which one do you want? Across the state, only about half a dozen stores open today. Many others aren't ready for business yet. One issue, a pot shortage. With long lines and short supplies, stores expect to sell out quickly and prices will be higher. But as more growers join the market, those prices should drop. For now, what you won't see in Washington is the huge array of edible products found in Colorado, the state strengthening regulations for testing and packaging. In the 2014 midterm elections, constituents in Alaska, Oregon, and even the District of Columbia continued the trend and voted to legalize cannabis for recreational use. The same election resulted in other states decriminalizing the plan. In Oregon, voters passed Measure 91, which legalizes the possession, use, and sale of recreational cannabis for adults 21 and older. Under Measure 91, adults can have up to eight ounces of cannabis at home and up to one ounce in public. Harvey coming his dispensary just off Northwest 23rd is one of 70 approved to operate in Portland. Following last night's vote to approve Measure 91, Cummings is hoping to get in on the new recreational market. Right now everything's nonprofit reimbursement, donations, going for the patient. Uh, we really look forward to being a mainstream business that just has a product that anybody's able to buy. Ideally, McKee and Cummings would like to be able to sell recreational and medical pot in their respective stores. They add their dispensaries are already regulated by the state, their product is tested, and they have security measures in place. Oregon expects cannabis tax revenues could range from 17 to $40 million annually, while other experts estimate a possible $100 million in tax income every year. Taxes collected from the cannabis sales will fund schools, police, and drug prevention and education programs in the state. The task of regulating and monitoring during this fledgling industry goes to the Oregon Liquor Control Commission. It's a huge job and a huge responsibility. Rob Patridge is the chair of the Oregon Liquor Control Commission. The agency now has until January 2016 to implement the new industry and decide who gets retail licenses. Uh, whether we can have kind of a medical marijuana store and a, re and a recreational store is still out. And this has always been a good one. Rules that Harvey Cummings says he and other dispensary owners are anxiously waiting for. Even though Alaska and Washington in D.C. legalized cannabis, there are significant differences in how these jurisdictions have implemented the reform. Unlike in Colorado and Washington, in Alaska and D.C., there are no pot stores. There's no place where you can buy it. If you're 21 or over, it's now legal in D.C. and Alaska uh, to possess a certain amount of pot. It's also legal to smoke pot, as long as you don't do it in public. But how are you supposed to get this pot that you can legally possess and legally smoke? You are not allowed to buy it, and nobody is legally allowed to sell it. The only way you are legally allowed to get it is to grow it. Or for somebody who has grown it themselves, uh, to freely give it to you in exchange for nothing. Not only can they not sell it to you, they can't trade you for it either. Uh, the Alaska Dispatch News did this handy Q&A on the day that Alaska legalized pot this week on Tuesday. And it's, you know, asking some very basic questions. What is still illegal as of February 24th when it, when it comes to pot? Well, among other things, you cannot sell pot. Really? Are you sure? Can I sell pot? No, you cannot sell pot. You can give away up to one ounce of marijuana in Alaska, but only, quote, without remuneration. 
meaning you cannot get paid at all if you give somebody pot. And payment doesn't just mean money. Payment means anything. Alaska thinks that by this time next year, the state will have regulations in place so people will be able to legally buy pot in the state instead of having to grow it or get it for free off somebody who grew it. That's going to change in Alaska within a year or so. On April 2nd, 2015, Alaska's State House passed Bill 75, clarifying municipal regulations in Ballot Measure 2, including the process for registering cannabis businesses. The bill also authorizes clubs where the plant could be consumed, gives municipalities power to establish civil and criminal penalties for businesses, creates provisions for communities to prohibit businesses, and allows for Alaskans to grow up to 24 plants instead of the original six allowed in Ballot Measure 2. Alaska's weed industry is expected to bring the state more than $72 million in tax revenue in the first five years, according to the Marijuana Policy Group. But in D.C., that's apparently never going to change. At least it's never going to change while the Republicans are in control of Congress. I mean, even though there is no Republican member of Congress from D.C., there are a handful of Republican congressmen, specifically uh, Jason Chaffetz of Utah, Mark Meadows of North Carolina, and Andy Harris of Maryland, uh, who have decided to make it their mission to stop D.C. from implementing its own law, which D.C. residents passed with 70% of the vote last November. By virtue of the vestigial constitutional relic that allows Congress to interfere in the local laws of D.C., these Republicans in the House were able to block the D.C. City Council and the D.C. Mayor uh, from establishing any rules and regulations governing the sale of pot in the districts. That's why, that's why D.C. isn't going to have pot stores like Washington and Colorado do. They do not appear to have blocked D.C. from moving ahead on the other things that were approved in that voter-approved initiative, including legalizing possessing pot and smoking it in private. They've only blocked the sale part of it. So D.C.'s mayor and city council and, and the police chief and the local authorities in D.C., uh, they made their plans. They made their plans for legalization to go into effect as of midnight last night. They put out this handy flyer explaining what that means. Selling pot, not permitted. Public consumption of pot, not permitted. Driving while high, obviously not permitted. Consumption in public housing, not permitted. Nobody under 21 can possess it or smoke it or grow it. But as long as you home grow and you only give it away for free, you, if you're over 21, can possess up to two ounces and you can get baked at home. So it's, it's, it's pretty limited in scope, right? But it is a change. And D.C.'s spunky new mayor uh, did this press availability to announce the change, to announce what was going to happen, to announce the rules, to announce that it was going into effect at midnight last night to take questions from the press. Explain, like, listen, I'm the mayor of the city. This is what we're doing. This is what that voter initiative means, and we're going ahead with it. She did that press availability, and the Republicans in Congress freaked out. Jason Chaffetz from Utah. Uh, and Mark Meadows from North Carolina, they sent the mayor of D.C. this threatening letter saying their oversight committee is in, in the House is, quote, investigating your recent assertions that, in your opinion, Initiative 71 will take effect on February 26th. Quote, we strongly suggest you reconsider your position. Quote, if you decide to move forward with the legalization of marijuana in your district, you will be doing so in knowing and willful violation of the law. And then they demanded that the mayor hand over to Congress a list of any D.C. employees who participated in any way, in any action related to the enactment of this initiative. They want the employee's salary and position, the amount of time the employee engaged in the actions. They want the list of actions taken. In case that threat wasn't clear enough, Congressman Jason Chaffetz, again, of Utah, uh, made the threat explicit. Uh, he told the Washington Post in an interview, quote, you can go to prison for this. We're not playing a little game here. We are putting them on notice. He told the Associated Press, quote, the penalties are severe and we're serious about this. Congressman Andy Harris is now demanding that the Attorney General of the United States and the Justice Department arrest D.C. city officials and the mayor. Congress blocked uh, Washington, D.C.'s uh, voter-approved uh, ballot measure to legalize yeah. Yeah. Uh, marijuana. And I just wonder, doesn't that cut against the whole Republican message of state rights and small government and power to the people that you and your party are such a fan of? Well, uh, Washington, D.C. is not a state. And Washington, D.C. has a lot to offer, but, you know, uh, free reign on marijuana use, uh, I just don't buy that. I just don't think that's, that's the way they should operate. So, 
states' rights, yes, but Washington, D.C. is not a state. So you point out that Washington, D.C. is not a state, but certainly everybody who lives in Washington, D.C. pays federal taxes. Uh, they voted uh, to allow that in the place where they live, and now Congress has come in and said, no, 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 we don't, we don't think that's appropriate. Yeah. Isn't that a little bit big brotherish, a little paternalistic? Well, again, uh, looking at the Constitution, it, it, Washington, D.C. is different. Uh, they're not a state. And uh, we have a role to play, and the Congress passed this. And um, I just don't think that recreational marijuana in Washington, D.C. Uh, is the right direction to go. What would you say to people who say, well, Mr. Chaffetz, I live in Washington, D.C., you live in Utah. It might not be right for Utah, but we believe in well, Washington, D.C. it I, is. I spend a, 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 lot, a lot of my time here as well. They are speaking loudly, but our residents also spoke loud and clear last November when seven out of ten of them went to the polls um, to vote to approve the legalization of small amounts of marijuana in Washington, D.C. for use by adults uh, in their homes. And I'm the mayor of the District of Columbia. I was elected, and my job is to implement the people's law. The people changed the law, and it's my job to implement it. Despite Congress's ability to block the sale of cannabis in D.C., they couldn't stop its decriminalization and what amounts to a government decree to grow and share cannabis. Cannabis enthusiasts can be creative, persistent, and generous people, and the weed community in D.C. proved it in March. Hundreds of people lined up outside a Washington, D.C. restaurant yesterday to get free marijuana seeds on the one month anniversary of the city's new marijuana law. You have the right to share seeds uh, up to one ounce to any individual, so why not just designate a location and have people come and get seeds? And so I'm giving away my spare seeds that people gave me, some seeds I found in bags of marijuana over the years. I feel like such a pioneer, like coming here and getting seeds and being able to grow your own marijuana and smoke it and be lovely, like I'm all for that. I'm just inspired not a drug. This is a plant that grows from the earth. God made it. No, there's no dealing going on here. And this is a fantastic crowd. It feels like a part of a community. Uh, there's like a lot of people here. It's a very civilized event. It's a very tone event. Colorado's legal cannabis industry made an astounding $700 million in 2014. According to the Colorado Department of Revenue, taxes, licenses, and fees brought the state more than $76 million. Additionally, tax revenue is expected to increase to $94 million annually in 2016. By then, cannabis will be a billion dollar industry in Colorado. According to the Washington Post, these numbers don't include money made from tourist spending or bongs and other cannabis paraphernalia, so the total economic impact is probably far greater. There's a healthy appetite for the Rocky Mountain High and no shortage of stores to supply the demand. There's the corner store in Denver. 173 even. A high-end boutique in Aspen, right around the corner from Prada and Gucci. Meg Sanders is a new breed of cannabis CEO, driven to push marijuana into the mainstream. A suburban mother of two, she left a private equity firm to run Mindful a chain of four retail stores that sells recreational and medicinal pot. I was working in a, in a small financial office and it just wasn't a lot of upward growth and what better opportunity than to jump into a fledgling industry, um, something that we'll never see again in our lifetime. Her 44,000 square foot marijuana factory is cutting edge. Automated water and nutrient systems feed the plant Lighting mimics the seasons so plants can be harvested year-round. All this in a warehouse right across the street from a Denver police station. Are you seeing a marijuana effect on the economy here? Absolutely. You can't find an empty warehouse in the city of Denver, really. I mean, you just can't. And then think of the ripple effect. I mean, we, we affect a ton of businesses, security, marketing, um, you know, web hosting, you it, we're a business just like anybody else, we have the same needs. Millions of dollars from cannabis are going toward education, law enforcement, drug prevention and treatment, and other necessities in Colorado, while arrests for cannabis are down and less crime is being committed. You say you're a business person, I think some parents would look at this and say, she's just peddling drugs. I can tell you that the drug dealer, a legal drug dealer on the corner in any state in this 
nation isn't carding, isn't checking your ID, so making sure you have a medical marijuana card or you're over 21. This industry does it every day. The stats show it. We've done a phenomenal job. Mindful expects to rake in $18 million this year, but it's not easy money. Colorado requires every plant grown by a licensed operator to be tracked from seed to sale. Each one has a barcoded radio frequency ID tag and is logged into a statewide database. Cameras watch it all. The goal is to keep every bud and bit off the black market. I do remember when this was rolled out, everyone thought that the sky was going to fall. Still there. <laughs> it didn't fall. And business is thriving, and the customers are still coming through the door. So clearly, if I'm looking at my business and I'm looking at those around me, the consumer is saying, yeah, this works. Furthermore, the Colorado State Board of Health approved about $8 million to fund eight studies investigating the medical benefits of cannabis. Researchers at various universities will test the efficacy of using cannabis to treat PTSD, Parkinson's disease, bowel disease, pediatric epilepsy, and brain tumors, as well as compare cannabis's painkilling abilities to prescription opioids. Despite the massive success of legal cannabis in Colorado, there have been a few issues with this rollout, including mislabeled cannabis edibles resulting in negative experiences and cannabis businesses having to deal entirely in cash. Colorado has since taken measures to alleviate the confusion over cannabis edibles. Andrew Friedman is Colorado's marijuana czar. He's a Harvard law grad, hand-picked by Colorado Governor John Hickenlooper to oversee the rollout of legalized recreational pot. I think one of the things we didn't see coming was that um, people were going to overdose on edibles. And we're not going to try to hide that problem. New rules and regulations came out faster than I think you ever see state government do something. New rules placed immediate limits on the amount of THC, marijuana's major psychoactive ingredient, allowed in edibles and required new labeling detailing the potency of each serving. Because cannabis is still illegal federally, banking has been a big issue for cannabis businesses in Colorado from the beginning. As long as the federal government continues to count pot proceeds as illegal drug money, most banks won't touch it. So Colorado's billion dollar marijuana industry is conducted almost entirely in cash. That's why Meg Sanders keeps a two-ton safe. From a public safety standpoint, it's definitely um, the number one issue that this industry faces. If you want to guarantee that a, a fledgling industry becomes corrupt and, and you know, becomes populated with gang activity, fake it all cash, right? That's as old as Al Capone, right? The cash creates corruption. Colorado Governor John Hickenlooper says a partial solution might be a new state chartered cannabis credit union. He's urging the federal government to approve it. Still, despite the problems, Governor Hickenlooper says he's encouraged by the rollout of this green experiment Colorado voters wanted. It's legal here. Mm -hmm. But outside of Colorado, it's still illegal. It's a federally illegal drug. Mm -hmm. How do you square those two? Uh, well, it is a round peg in a, a square hole. It takes everybody being creative in ways they haven't been creative before and, and knowing that at any time the federal government could come and shut us down and tell us that what we're doing is illegal in their eyes. Mm. You still think that's possible? Sure. It's completely possible that in a few years somebody comes around and says, a new president says, we are not okay with you doing this. The federal government isn't the only threat to Colorado's legal cannabis market. Several lawsuits from an anti-drug group, sheriffs, and nearby states, Nebraska and Oklahoma, seek to repeal cannabis legalization and reinstate prohibition. If I defend and uphold the rights of an individual under Colorado Constitution to have marijuana, then that puts me in violation of my oath office on the federal ends. Smith calls it a crisis of conscience. And the lawsuit asks a federal judge to strike down the law and close more than 300 licensed retail marijuana stores. There is nothing that requires Colorado to enforce federal marijuana laws. Mason Tevert speaks for the Marijuana Policy Project. Colorado is taking steps to control it. These guys are taking steps to bring back an underground market. It's estimated that nearly half of Colorado's recreational marijuana buyers come from other states where this is illegal. Law enforcement officials from Nebraska and Kansas, two of Colorado's neighbors, have joined the suit 
saying they've been overwhelmed by illegal drug activity that flows across Colorado's border. On traffic stops, they're coming up with a lot of marijuana coming through, which requires the arrest time, the prosecution time, the jail time, the prison time. It was only a matter of time that Colorado was going to have to face what the voters did in federal courts, and so now that day has come. Former U.S. Attorney Troy Ide says he's not surprised this case has finally come, and the plaintiffs don't surprise him either. These states didn't vote for marijuana decriminalization or otherwise, but now they're bearing the effects, and so they're looking to Colorado to put aside its law. But in a statement, Colorado Attorney General John Southers says he expected this. Quote, it appears the plaintiff's primary grievance stems from non-enforcement of federal laws regarding marijuana, as opposed to choices made by the voters of Colorado. We believe this suit is without merit, and we will vigorously defend against it in the United States Supreme Court. Colorado's Governor John Hickenlooper says the state will continue to defend its marijuana law. Washington, D.C., Alaska, and Oregon weren't the only states to see cannabis law reform after the 2014 midterm elections. South Portland, Maine, decriminalized cannabis. A year after Portland, the state's largest city, legalized recreational cannabis. Californians voted to reclassify nonviolent crimes, like drug possession, from felonies to misdemeanors, which could downgrade about 40,000 felonies each year and allow about 10,000 people to be eligible to leave state prisons early. And New Jersey passed a bail reform measure allowing low-level drug offenders a chance to be released when they can't afford bail and aren't a threat to the community. Additionally, Vermont and Rhode Island could legalize cannabis as early as 2015, while while Utah may legalize medicinal cannabis. Unfortunately, legalized medical cannabis failed to pass in Florida. Despite 57% voter support, it required 60% to pass. According to the Washington Post, billionaire casino owner, Republican donor, and eighth richest person in the world, Sheldon Adelson, spent $5 million to help defeat the measure, which was about 85% of the total funding used to campaign against the Florida measure. What else is happening in Florida? Police in Florida shot and killed a 26-year-old man by the name of Derek Cruz after uh, the SWAT team entered his home at 6 in the morning because they had a pot warrant, okay? So uh, there were six other friends in the house, and uh, they apparently saw what happened, and they're claiming that this was straight-out murder. At 6.32 a.m., Deputy Todd Rabel, 36, fired one shot, hitting Cruz in the face as he stood inside the doorway. The officer has already alleged that uh, Cruz was resisting arrest. Cruz was not wearing a shirt, okay? He was unarmed. They did not find a weapon on him. So I'm not entirely sure how much of a threat he was to the police official there, but nonetheless, he was shot in the face, okay? Over a pot warrant. Unfortunately, horrible stories are common in the cannabis war. You were sentenced to life without parole for possession of marijuana? Hey, yeah, that's what I'm doing. Do you wonder how did I get here? Every day. It, it's unbelievable. Mazansky was busted 20 years ago for seven pounds of pot. Why should you go free? Justice is supposed to be fair and equal. In my case, I don't think it was. Uh, Mazansky isn't alone thinking that way. LifeForPot.org currently lists 25 nonviolent marijuana offenders serving life sentences in U.S. prisons. Locked away with violent offenders serving less time, Mazansky tells me how the state of Missouri threw away the key after he broke a three strikes law targeting repeat drug offenders. He gets emotional thinking about what it has cost him. He just became a great grandfather. Found that out about a month ago. Well, I got grandkids I've never seen. Do you think you will go free? I think with the help of the people I will eventually, if I can live long enough. Despite the amazing progress of many states to reform their cannabis laws, the federal government continues to be their biggest barrier to proper implementation of said laws. If true reform is going to happen, it must include the federal government. I don't come at this from an ideological perspective. I come at this from a scientific perspective. And you know, the, and the American Academy of Pediatrics had an excellent policy piece that came out last week, um, uh, not supporting legalization. And one of the things that they said that I think resonates with us about how we think about legalization efforts is that the 
the most salient criteria as we think about drug policy in the United States should be about what are the harms as it relates to the youth of our country. And that really is the pivotal reason for us why we have not been supportive of legalization efforts. It doesn't mean, however, that we need, that we don't need to continue to think about how we reform our criminal justice system, how we deal with issues of disproportionality as it relates to arrest and incarceration. It doesn't mean that. It means that we believe that there's another way to move forward um, as we think about drug policy in the United States that is balanced. It's not about a war on drugs and it's not about legalization. In May 2014, Congress passed a historic amendment protecting medicinal cannabis operations in states where the conduct is legal. Unfortunately, this didn't stop the Department of Justice from going after some legal cannabis businesses. According to DOJ spokesman Patrick Roddenbush, the law only stops it from impeding the ability of states to carry out their medical marijuana laws. He said, we don't expect that the amendment will impact our ability to prosecute private individuals or private entities who are violating the Controlled Substances Act. But co-sponsors of the amendment say the DOJ is wrong in its understanding of the law. According to Ken Grubbs, spokesman for Congressman Dana Rohrabacher, the amendment's language is perfectly clear. The DOJ's self-referential interpretation is emphatically wrong. Another congressman responsible for the bill, Sam Farr, said, No reasonable person thinks prosecuting patients doesn't interfere with a state's medical marijuana laws. Lawyers can try to mince words, but Congress was clear. Stop going after patients and dispensaries. The amendment to stop the federal government from interfering with state cannabis laws was necessary, evidenced by the DOJ position, but also by the federal government's actions. Under the Obama administration, the DEA continues to raid cannabis dispensaries and send people to prison, even though they comply with state laws. According to advocacy group Americans for Safe Access, the administration spends almost $80 million annually, which is more than $200,000 per day, cracking down on legal medicinal cannabis. Because of these issues, two more bipartisan bills were introduced in the Senate and Congress in March 2015. Both bills are identical and seek to drastically reduce the federal government's ability to interfere with state legal cannabis programs. The Historic bills call for six major policy changes, allow patients, doctors, and businesses to participate in their state's medical cannabis programs without fear of being prosecuted by the federal government, reclassify cannabis as a less dangerous substance, moving it from Schedule 1 to 2, as a plant is currently classified alongside drugs like heroin and LSD, give veterans easier access to medical cannabis, eliminate barriers to cannabis research, remove low THC strains of weed from the controlled substances list, and open up bank for cannabis businesses. We will raise new revenues to help education, addiction, and uh, law enforcement. And most important, we'll be better able to focus on how to protect our kids than the vast unregulated black market that exists now. Consequently, just think of it, widespread use of marijuana, particularly by young people of every background is and long has been de facto legal and should no longer be a federal offense. We preserve the ability of local communities to make their own determination just as they do with alcohol if or how they choose to license uh, sale through any dispensaries. My message to my fellow Republicans is wake up and see where the American people are but also see what the fundamental principles are in this debate. The fundamental principles are individual liberty, which Republicans have always talked about, uh, limited government, which Republicans have always talked about, the doctor-patient relationship, which of course we've been stressing a lot about lately, and, uh, and of course states' rights and the Tenth Amendment. These are things that Republicans have the principles that we've been talking about for all of these 26 years. Furthermore, in February 2015, two congressmen filed separate House bills that would legalize, regulate, and tax cannabis at the federal level, ending U.S. cannabis prohibition. Representative Jared Paulus of Colorado introduced the Regulate Marijuana Like Alcohol Act, which would remove the plant from the controlled substances list, transfer oversight of the substance from the DEA to the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, and Explosives, and regulate cannabis similar to alcohol. Representative Earl Blue 
Blumenauer from Oregon introduced the Marijuana Tax Revenue Act, which would set up a federal excise tax for cannabis. The bills would not force states to legalize cannabis, but simply create a regulatory framework for states that do decide to legalize. Attorney General Eric Holder recently announced reforms to civil asset forfeitures, the controversial government practice of taking property from people accused of drug activity. Asset forfeiture effectively makes people guilty until proven innocent. When this occurs, they've already had their money and property stolen from the government and cannot get it back. Unfortunately, the new DOJ budget projects the changes instituted by Holder will barely make a difference. This is because Holder only ended one small part of the asset forfeiture program, federal adoptions of money and goods taken by police. This means police departments can no longer split 20% of the proceeds from seizures with the federal government in order to work around state laws. While Holder has made some small positive reform changes, these could be undone by the new Attorney General, Loretta Lynch, when she takes office. Do you support legalization of marijuana? Senator, I do not. Not only do I not support legalization of marijuana, it is not the position of the Department of Justice currently to support the legalization, nor would it be the position should I become confirmed as Attorney General. Despite this, President Barack Obama and members of his administration have talked positively about drug law reform. While not in favor of legalization, Obama supports decriminalization and, for the most part, has allowed states to go ahead with legalization. But this could change in the future. We're in a really weird place yeah. with with marijuana right now. Like, it's illegal in some places, but it's illegal everywhere, but in some places it's kind of okay, and it leads to excessive incarceration, especially among minorities, and in places where it's been legalized, everything's doing okay. Yeah. I, how do we move forward out of this legal gray area weirdness? Well, uh, what you, you're seeing now is Colorado, Washington, uh, through state referendum, they're experimenting with legal marijuana. The position of my administration has been that we still have federal laws that classify marijuana as a, as an illegal substance, but uh, we're not going to spend a lot of resources trying to turn back decisions that have been made at the state level on this issue. Uh, my suspicion is, is that you're going to see other states start looking at this. What I am doing at the federal level is asking my Department of Justice just to examine generally how we are treating nonviolent drug offenders. Because I think you're right. Uh, you know, what we have done is instead of focusing on treatment, the same way we focused, say, with tobacco mm -hmm. uh, or uh, drunk driving or uh, other mm -hmm. problems where we treat it as a public health problem, we've treated this exclusively as a criminal problem. And I think that it's been counterproductive and it's been, uh, you know, devastating in a lot of. Uh, minority communities. Um, it presents the possibility, at least, of unequal application of the law. Mm -hmm. And uh, that has to be changed. Now, the good news is, is that we're starting to get some interest among Republicans as well as Democrats uh, in, in reforming the criminal justice system. Um, we've been able to initiate some changes administratively. And last year, you had the first time in 40 years where the crime rate and the incarceration rate went down at the same time. Uh, I hope we can continue with those trends uh, because uh, there's just a smarter way of uh, dealing with these issues. I think when you look at many of the president's comments, he really is talking about this from a criminal justice context, that, you know, we can't continue down this path of arresting and incarcerating, and particularly, you know, particularly young kids of color and the impact that we see here. And, you know, completely agree with that as it relates to drug policy. But, but when you look at kind of what the impact of legalization might portend for us, and, and, and not just legalization, but I also have significant concern with the commercialization of marijuana. Mm -hmm. You know, having done public health for a long time, I think that we see, quite honestly, the industry being, y using some of the same tactics, quite honestly, that the tobacco industry has used as they thought about marketing their product. That said, he's also made clear that he, um, uh, with the De Department of Justice monitoring this, is keeping a close eye on what's happening in Colorado and Washington. Mm -hmm. I don't want to speak out of both sides of my mouth. You know, if we say that we're science and data driven, we need to be science and data driven and so part of what we're looking at and these are largely you know publicly available data sets as well as work with the National Institute of Drug Abuse is looking at and in concert with Colorado and Washington what has been the impact what is the impact I think quite honestly it's too soon to tell 
in terms of what those uh, uh, issues mean. So how soon are people going to be able to make judgments around the wisdom or merits of what's happening in Colorado and Washington? What are going to be the key criteria? Sure. So, so our office is, you know, we, we do not intend to issue some level of definitive report yeah. saying, oh, it worked. Yeah. It didn't. Yeah. But, but part of it is a commitment to continue to roll out public data. L largely, these are existing data sets that exist that look at um, uh, things like youth use, that looks at things like treatment admissions, that look at things like uh, 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 drug driving episodes, that look at diversion of marijuana from one state to another. Mm -hmm. so, so part of what you know we feel a responsibility at ONDCP is to make available those, those data sets to, to allow people to make a determination on kind of what what they think um, you know the the impact is during his time in office President Obama has also used his executive power to grant clemency to 40 federal drug defendants including 12 who were serving life sentences for nonviolent drug crimes however this is insignificant considering the more than 2 million people in US prisons the highest percentage of which are for drug crimes especially cannabis under the Obama administration we've really undertaken some significant reforms as it relates to drug policy in the United States I think for you know, you know, a long time we've relied on uh, anecdote um, to guide policy, um, and you know, under the this administration, we're really focused on a science-based, evidence-based strategy. One of the areas that we have been really trying to focus on our public health strategy is really looking at, from both a policy perspective and a budget perspective, focusing on things like prevention, treatment, and recovery. The the other piece that I think this administration really needs some credit for is is how we've looked at things, um, how we've approached sentencing reform activity, um, and and it really really is, I think, important to understand the track record of both the President and the Attorney General, particularly as it relates to low-level offenders who are coming in contact with the criminal justice system largely as a result of their own addictive disorders. And when we think of our policy, we look at it in three fundamental ways. One, how do we divert people away from the criminal justice system in the first place? So how do we enhance policy? How do we enhance practice? How do we do things like increasing the opportunity for police department to, to have a different intervention other than just arresting someone and incarcerating them. We know that the vast majority of people who are in our prison facilities are there largely because of their own substance use disorders and how do we make sure they get good care and treatment? And then how do we make sure people who are recovering from their addiction and particularly those with criminal records don't face lifelong barriers as a result of their criminal records um, uh, uh, because of their addictive disorders. Regardless of what Michael Botticelli, director of the White House Office of National Drug Control Policy and Obama say, they've still failed to stop the DOJ, DEA, and other agencies from making it difficult for states where medicinal and recreational cannabis is legal. Moreover, President Obama and Attorney General Holder have still not used their powers to downgrade cannabis to a Schedule II drug, nor has any effort been made to decriminalize cannabis or support politicians who are trying to end prohibition. Speaking publicly about positive reform while hoping others will take up the task only furthers the confusion created by conflicting laws. Furthermore, the changes made by the Obama administration are too small and could be easily rolled back by future administrations. It's time for Obama to end the decades-long drug war. Fortunately, while the federal government stalls, state governments continue to pass positive cannabis law reforms.